yesterday I was reading through uh, Matthew 16. Of course, I knew I, I'd been preparing this message on how messy life can get because even after encountering the Lord, we tend to be kind of messy, kind of inconsistent and immature in our, in our living because growth takes time. And I came across the example of Peter. It just kind of hit me right between the eyes. In Matthew 16, remember, Jesus is asking his disciples way up north. He's up around Caesarea Philippi. And he says, who do men say to the wife to say that I am? And after the apostles told him about some of the theories that were being discussed by the crowd, Jesus nailed him and he said, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter spoke to him and said, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the one of the Son of God. And Jesus said, you didn't come up with this answer on your own. God gave you this answer. You were inspired by God. Well, of course, it was just a couple of minutes later that Jesus was talking about how he had to go to Jerusalem and to be betrayed and to be crucified, but then to be raised from the dead. And it was Peter, the same one who had been so inspired just moments before, who said, oh, Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about. This will never happen to you. And of course, Jesus turned to him and said, get you behind me, Satan, because you're distracting me. Well, today we're going to continue our series of messages from the book of Genesis. And today we're going to pick up where we left off last week in the story of Jacob and uh, son of Isaac and Rebekah, the brother of Esau. Uh, we're going to be going through chapter 29 if you want to have it before you. But as you remember, uh, Jacob tricked his brother uh, Esau out of his inheritance. And Esau was so furious that he was ready to kill Jacob whenever their father Isaac passed away. So Jacob took off for the land of his ancestors to wait for Esau to calm down. And incidentally, also to look for a wife. And that will become part of our, our story today. Then when he stopped for the night on the first day of the journey, he fell asleep. He had a dream of uh, where he had a vision of God. And God told him a couple of very important things. I ask you to cover these in your notes if you're following along in the outline. God says, I am the Father, I am the Lord God, the God of Abraham and Isaac. And then the most important part of this promise is, in my opinion, I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go. And then, as I said last week, as far as I can tell in the book of Genesis, this is the first time God pledges a personal relationship, a personal interaction with one of the patriarchs, and it's to Jacob. So this was a major turning point in Jacob's life in which he, you know, he said afterwards, the God of my grandfather, the God of my father is now my God, and I know he's here with me, and on this promise I'm going to build my, my life. And in fact, to put action to his promise, he says, I'm going to give to the Lord a tithe of everything he gives to me. So that was kind of the proof of, of his sincerity. And at that time, Jacob became a new man. Now, if Genesis were some sort of sappy romance novel, uh, Jacob would be perfect from here on out. His teeth would be whiter. His clothes would never get wrinkled. He would stand taller. His boots or sandals would never get dirty. You know, uh, he, he, every prayer would be answered right away. He would meet every challenge with faith and determination. But Genesis is not a sappy romance. It's a real life record of real life people who live, to be honest, some rather messy lives, just like us. It seems to me that Jacob struggles his way through life. And things don't always go his way. He doesn't always respond the way he should either. Now, sometimes we do see progress in his life and sometimes we don't. He was the kind of man who would take two steps forward, but then maybe one and a half steps backwards. You know anybody like that? Do you look at somebody like that in the mirror every morning? See, I see a lot of myself in Jacob. The more I get to know Jacob and look into the details of his life, I see a lot of myself in him. The thing is, today we live in a culture where if you've got a flaw or two, that will get you canceled. There's no in between. It even has a name. In the news media, you hear it called the cancel culture. In real life, though, there is an in between. There is a middle 
ground between people who are all good and all bad. And in real life, spiritual growth takes years, even decades. And it gets really, really messy at times. I remember hearing a story, Andy Stanley wrote this in an article I, uh, in, that I read a few years ago. In fact, I shared it with the elders at the time. Andy Stanley of the uh, church in, uh, in Decatur, Georgia. There was a gay pride parade going on on a hot summer's day in Atlanta. It was right outside their church. And he got the idea of calling some men together, well, some church members, men and women, I suppose, both. And what did they do? They took ice water, pitchers of ice water, out to the marchers and gave it to them. And of course, some of them said, what are you doing here? What are you doing offering us water? And they said, it's because that's what Jesus would want us to do. And Andy made this point, he said, Life is not always cut and dried. We weren't condoning what they were doing. We weren't condoning their lifestyle or what they were representing. But our determination was to show grace to them anyway. And frankly, grace is sometimes messy. I've never forgotten that. And life does really get messy at times. So today, let's talk about that messy middle ground that takes place between the time we meet the Lord and the time that our journey is over. And here's a spoiler alert about Jacob. Over time, even with his flaws, there's enough growth, there's enough transformation, enough redemption that God will eventually call himself what? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You know, when God attaches his name to your name, you know something pretty special is going on. So let's look at today's story. After Jacob woke up from his dream uh, at a place he called Bethel, the house of God, he continued the 400 mile journey up to the land of his ancestors, Peyton Aram, where his uh, family was from. He wanted to marry someone from among his own people, just like his father Isaac had done so many years before. So he arrived at a well outside of town where he met up with some shepherds who were waiting to water their flocks. And so he asked them where they were from. Well, from the city of Haran. Uh, this is where Jacob's relatives lived. Do you know Laban, he asked. Well, Laban was his uncle, his mother, Rebecca's brother. So we've mentioned him before in this series. He's a rather colorful character. And the shepherd said, yes, we know him. In fact, here comes his daughter, Rachel. And she's a shepherd also. Jacob said to them, by the way, it's early in the afternoon and the sheep need water. Why aren't you watering your, your goats and your sheep so they can go out to the pasture and, and graze some more? And the shepherds gave some sort of off-putting, flimsy excuse. Well, we wait until we're all together before we remove the stone and then we water the sheep together. Well, I doubt the stone was too heavy, as we'll see in just a moment. It's just, they were, it was just inconvenient. It was there to keep the water clean, to keep stuff from falling into the well and clogging it up. Uh, and it was a little heavy, so okay. Now, Jacob might have had his faults, but laziness wasn't one of them. The sheep needed to be watered so they could get back to grazing. And also, at about this time, Jacob saw Rachel coming. And he was captivated. She must have been a real stunner. So he took charge of the situation. I'm sure impressing Rachel was part of his motivation. And he went to the well and he moved the stone by himself, the stone that covered the top of the well, and he watered his uncle's sheep. That tells us something about Jacob. But he was a man of initiative. He could see what needed to be done. He could size it up right away, and then he could take action. He would take it on himself to do what needed to be done in a given situation. And these were his uncle's sheep, the uncle he hoped to impress, because he knew right away he wanted Rachel for his wife. And they needed water right now. So Jacob took care of it. Genesis 29, 11 says that after watering the sheep, he went on up to Rachel and get this, he planted a big old kiss on her. And then he began to cry. Guys, have you ever done that with your wife? Well, apparently that was a cultural thing and we don't understand it, but <laughs> it didn't get him slapped or anything. He, uh, but anyway, never, nevertheless, Eventually, verse 12 says he did properly introduce himself and let the folks know that he was from their family, their extended family. 
and he was Isaac, Rebekah's son. And at that point, Rachel ran home to get her father Laban. And she soon returned with Laban, and when Laban told him his story, I'm sorry, when Jacob told Laban the story, Laban embraced Jacob and said, you are my flesh and blood. You gotta realize, this is Rebekah's son. The last time he saw his Rebekah's sister, she was riding off on a camel to go be married to Isaac, and now Rebekah's son, and Isaac's son, comes to pay a visit. This was exciting. Well, at that point, Jacob begins working for Laban. After a month, Laban says, well, we should probably work out the details of your wages. And at this point, we get the first indication of a change that's going on in, Laban's, or in Jacob's heart. You remember how he manipulated his brother into selling the birthright for a bowl of stew. You remember also that, um, that he would later cheat um, uh, Isaac into giving him the blessing. And this time though, rather than trying to manipulate or cheat or you know, do something to get a good deal with Laban, he just starts working, no strings attached. And Laban could see for himself what, what kind of worker Jacob was. Besides, Jacob knew he wasn't really coming there to find a job, he was there to find a wife. Now, Laban had two daughters. One was Leah, she was the older one, and Rachel was the younger. The Bible says Leah had soft eyes or delicate eyes or weak eyes. The Hebrew there is a little bit unclear. We're not, not sure what that phrase exactly means, but we do know what the next phrase means. This is verse 17. Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Now we've talked about how it's very rare in Hebrew literature of any kind, much less the scriptures, for a physical description to be given. So this must be really remarkable, how beautiful this young lady was. And bingo, right away, Jacob knew this is what he wanted. He was in love with Rachel from the start, and he desperately wanted to marry her. So he told Laban, listen, I'll work for you for seven years in return for Rachel's hand in marriage. Laban said, it's a deal. So for the next seven years, Jacob worked hard, though it seemed like it was just a few days to him because he was so infatuated with Rachel. He wanted her so much. And when the time came for them to finally be married, there was a huge feast, a great day of celebration. Sorry, my microphone's slipping up here. Gotta get that uh, taken care of. The great celebration, and the time came to consummate the marriage that evening. So uh, Jacob was waiting in his tent so his bride could arrive, and Laban brought his bride in. And, uh, and that was that, until the next morning when Jacob realized something's going on here. Because instead of Rachel, it was Leah that was with him. How could this happen? Well, the tent was probably dark, and it's very likely that Jacob had um, celebrated a bit too much the night before. Maybe she was wearing a veil. However it happened, it happened. The deal was done, the marriage was consummated, and that was that. Jacob confronted Laban about this. We had a deal. I worked seven years for you so that you could marry, so I could marry Rachel. Why have you tricked me? Doesn't this sound ironic? That Jacob, the tricker, the cheater, the manipulator, the deceiver, would himself be tricked. Jacob was no stranger to trickery, but now the tables have turned and he had met his match in Laban. <clears throat> Laban simply said, you should have known that it would be against our custom to allow the younger daughter to be married first. So regardless of the intentions of the first pledge, their agreement seven years before, Leah was now Jacob's wife. Laban then said to Jacob, in effect, I'll make a deal with you. I'll let you marry Rachel next week if you will agree to work for me for another seven years. Well, Jacob was so infatuated and so in love that he didn't have any choice. If he wanted Rachel, he had to say yes, so he did. And he agreed to work for Laban for another seven years in exchange for Rachel's hand in marriage. So now, Jacob has two wives all of a sudden, Leah and Rachel, who were, by the way, two very different temper temperaments, very different women, and they never really got along all that well together, to be honest with you. And as you can imagine, it was pretty tense. Now Jacob would stay there in Paden Aram for a total of 20 years. He would build up quite a fortune, 
in spite of the fact that Laban was there trying to hinder him every step of the way. But eventually Jacob would return to Canaan to be near his father. And along the way, he would encounter his brother Esau, uh, the brother who had threatened to take his life. Remember that? And that encounter went okay. They were never buddies. They were never friends after that. In fact, there's no record of them even meeting again after this one encounter. But at least they sort of buried the hatchet without being in each other's backs, as it were. Over the years, Jacob would also become a father of 12 sons. And one of them, he named Joseph the one he gave a, an amazing technicolor dream coat to. But I'm getting ahead of myself. For now, in the time we have remaining, let's look back at some of the lessons we can learn, taking a, a kind of a broad view of Jacob's life. There are three lessons here I hope will help you understand what is going on with Jacob, what's happening in his life, and maybe help you understand what is going on in your life too. Because I'd like to suggest that if you're Christian today, and I think all of us are, then you live in the messy middle too. You are somewhere along that journey between the time you first met God on a personal basis and the time when Jesus calls you home. You live in the messy middle. What are you, what, what's going on here? First thing I want you to see is the past doesn't let you go without a fight. When Jacob had his experience with God at Bethel, he was ready for a new start. He wanted to put the past behind him. He, uh, he looked at his life. He realized what a mess he'd made of things. And so he made a commitment. He says, this will not be my future. From now on, I'm putting God first in my life. And I mean business. Remember, he pledged the tithe. I will no longer be the deceiver, the manipulator, the cheater, the schemer. And so when he got to Peyton Aram, he gave himself wholeheartedly to the service of Laban. He thought about building a family and to create a new future, and so far, so good. Some would say it's very ironic that after being a deceiver, he would now become a, a victim of deception himself, but that's kind of how life works sometimes. That what goes around comes around. You reap what you sow. In fact, Paul says in Galatians 6, 7, he says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And when you sow cheating and dishonesty and, and uh, manipulation like Jacob did, then you're inviting that to come into your life and to happen to you. Now, this is not God getting even with you. Don't get me wrong. It's just the law of sowing and reaping. And it applies to everyone. You see, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're baptized for the washing away of your sins, God forgives you of your sins. That's a fact. God no longer holds the past against you, but there's still some baggage left. Some things that you have sowed that may very well come back to be your reaping later. You're going to be finding some times during this messy middle that there are, there are times when you're ready to do away with the past, but the past isn't quite ready to do away with you. And it's still going to be there. And there's going to be that baggage, there's going to be that fallout, there's going to be there's those repercussions from the past that you'll have to deal with, sometimes for a very long time. There are times when we find ourselves wanting to break free from the past, but the past doesn't want to let go. Not without a fight. But it's a fight that God can help us win, and he will help us win. No matter what, kind, what the past looks like, no matter what kind of baggage we carry, God can make us more than conquerors through him who loved us, even Christ. But it takes time. And that's what Jacob discovered. It took time. In the meantime, just like him, we find ourselves stuck in the messy middle. That place between the beginning of our journey with God and his conclusion. And we're trying to build a life that's pleasing to God, but we're still dealing with some stuff from yesterday. Whichever area of your life you're hoping to change, maybe it's your marriage, your finances, your health, um, your spiritual life, don't be surprised if you spend time in that messy middle. Where things aren't always cut and dried, where things aren't always clear, things are not always consistent and perfectly clean and black and white, it gets messy. <clears throat> and you might be there for a while, like it was with Jacob. But you know what? You keep walking with God, you keep sowing the seeds of faith and obedience and after a while, the messy middle becomes the manageable middle. 
and then eventually it becomes the distant past. And you find that you have moved forward. Here's the second lesson we learned. Let's just forget that microphone. This is the second lesson we learned from this chapter in Jacob's life, and that is that the greatest obstacle we have to overcome is ourselves. I think it can be said of every one of us that we are our own worst enemy. And I've learned from experience this is usually true. The Christian author Watchman Nee has written, he says, anyone who serves God will discover, discover sooner or later that the greatest hindrance to his work is not others but himself. Can I have an amen to that? Mm -hmm. I saw this principle at work this week in the news about Jerry Falwell Jr. Have y'all seen that? Former Chancellor and President of Liberty Christian University lost his position because of a personal scandal. If the reports are true, and I, I'm not saying they are or they aren't, but if the reports are true, then he was his own worst enemy. And so are we all. Now Jacob saw God and he was ready to build a new life. His attitude toward God had changed. His attitude toward himself had changed. His past had changed. His behavior began to change. But there were still some things conspicuously absent from Jacob's life. And he wasn't there yet. For example, his priorities weren't yet where they needed to be. You know, his infatuation with Rachel told him or, or got him uh, looking after some things and forgetting about other more important things. Um, he, he wasn't yet prepared to fully rely on God. We see it when today's story begins with, the, with Jacob meeting Rachel at the well. This recalls a story you may remember from a few weeks ago when it was Abraham's servant that was looking for a bride for Isaac, Jacob's father. And he also stopped at a well where he eventually met Re Rebekah, Jacob's mother. And notice this, the servant prayed that God would help him find a woman of character, a woman of strength. Then Re when Rebekah appeared and showed the kind of person she was, the servant offered his thanks and his praise to God. Later, when he was talking to Laban, the servant testified how God's hand had been at work in all of this. And he gave testimony about God's power. And when Laban tried to manipulate the situation and say, you can't leave for 10 days, the servant got the upper hand and said so he had the wisdom to stand firm and not let Laban have his way. Now contrast this with Jacob. Jacob did not pray for guidance. He did not thank God for provision. He did not ask God for help. We just see Jacob kind of bulldozing his way forward. Rachel was beautiful and that was that. That's all that mattered to Jacob. Later in the story, we see that Jacob wasn't exactly the most tender and attentive of, hus of husbands. Uh, Leah quite justifiably felt unloved. After all, she had been manipulated into this marriage by her father. Rachel was jealous and insecure. She was, even though she was beautiful, she was actually quite a handful. Jason, Jacob basically said, girls, this isn't my problem. You deal with it, get over it. He had a lot to learn about being a husband. You see, Jacob's greatest obstacle in life was not Laban, his greedy father-in-law. His greatest obstacle was Jacob himself. And it's the same with you and me. I think we have a tendency to sabotage our own success, the success that God is trying to give us. We may blame this person or that situation for our lack of progress, when the reality is we need to take a good, hard look at ourselves and give serious consideration to what it is about our own behavior that needs to change. For example, you've accepted Christ and been baptized for the washing away of sins, that's great, but maybe you're not spending enough time in God's word, or you're not making everything a matter of prayer, or you're not walking in step with the Holy Spirit, or you're not thanking God for what he has done and what he is doing in your life. If you want Jesus to bless your marriage, your family, your career, your work, but you're not ready to change your schedule, your approach, your relationships, then you're on, you're on, you are your own worst enemy. You want Jesus to heal you, you wanna be blessed financially, you want God to use you, but you're not willing to follow his leadership, his teaching, his guidance, 
I think his response would be, give me first place in your life and I'll take care of the success. Remember, that's what Jesus says in Matthew 6, He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. What things? Those things that you crave after, what to eat, what to wear, all the good stuff of this world. God will take care of that stuff. You seek him first. The lesson we learn from the life of Joseph is this. If you, as you work your way through the messy middle, pay close attention to your own behavior. Make sure that you are seeking first God's kingdom, following God's wisdom. Here's the third lesson we learned from the life of Jacob, and that's this. In spite of your limitations, God is ready to bless the best of your efforts. You know, spiritual growth is not a pass-fail, either-or, black-or-white situation. The road to maturity is a messy one, and it takes a long time to get there. At Bethel, Jacob made some serious decisions about his future, and you can see a change in his behavior, but it took time, lots of time. Jacob had many good qualities. He was a leader. He was willing to take initiative. He was a hard worker. Uh, he kept his word. Later on, we learned he was a problem solver. He's pretty smart. He tried to be fair with people. And it was because of these qualities that God was able to bring some blessings into Jacob's life. In time, Jacob became a leader in his own right, a patriarch, a rich man, because God was able to bless what Jacob offered to God. And I'd like to suggest that that principle applies to us too, that God will use whatever you give him and he will bless the best of what you offer to him as well. Let's start to wind it up. The past doesn't go down without a fight. And we have to deal with it a lot longer than we'd probably like to. We also have a tendency to sabotage our success because we're not fully surrendered to God. And if we're not, that's something that needs to change. So where does this leave us? Well, it leaves us in the messy middle. That middle ground between being born again and being ready for heaven. And we're all making our way. And yet, in spite of our limitations, our failures, our defects, God is still willing to bless the best of whatever we can offer him. That's what he did with Jacob. And next week, we're going to see Jacob take a great leap forward. In the meantime, here's the principle I want you to latch on today. That the more you give God to work with, the more he can bring into your life. At camp, the kids used to sing a song that went, I want more of Jesus, so I'll give him more of me. So do you want more of God in your life? Then give him more of you. Today we come to our time of decision. And I want to just simply ask you, where are you on your journey? Are there still some things in your life that you need to surrender to God? Some things that you're still carrying around, some baggage, and you're, you need to ask God to help let go of those things? Are there some practices, some sinful attitudes, some sinful behaviors that are hindering you from your growth in Christ? Maybe this is a time when you need to relinquish those, surrender those to God as well. Maybe there's some goals you need to set. And say, Lord, in this coming month or this coming year, here's some things I want to accomplish. But to get there, I will seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And then would you bless. Today, our hymn of decision is, I surrender all. I want to emphasize that we're all. Have you given it all to Jesus? Let's stand right now and let's sing.